So the layout of this talk, basically, we're, um, it's about group analysis. It's a big topic. Um, in the early days of FMI data analysis, people, I mean, you could do away with just simple t-tests. But nowadays, as the experiment designs become more, more and more sophisticated, um, we may need uh, uh, complicated uh, models. So that's why we need to spend uh, quite a bit of time covering the uh, group analysis part. So first, we're going to talk about some basic concepts, terminologies to, to clear. Then uh, we switch to those uh, specific modeling approaches at the group level. Then there are some uh, miscellaneous issues, like centering, like, um, Intersubject correlation and intersubject uh, in, intra cross correlation. Then, uh, lastly, we'll talk about something new, which is a um, uh, little bit dramatically different from the typical group analysis. Because the typical group analysis, we usually do voxel wise to the whole brain. That approach is nowadays, it, it is a little bit troubling because of the correction approach. Usually, I mean, now the reverse requires you to perform a so-called Wiggers cluster correction. It's my personal opinion is overly uh, penalizing, too conservative. So and as, as a user, you probably feel like sometimes it's very difficult to get your clusters to pass such a threshold approach. So um, we're developing a new approach, which we right now we don't do at uh, whole brain level instead. We focus on some of our RIs. Those RIs can be, I mean, uh, based on previous studies, based on meta analysis, or based on some atlas available. Suppose you have 200 something, 250 RIs based on atlas, then you can focus on the, uh, do the group analysis, either those RIs. That will give you some uh, legal room to uh, get around the uh, multiple comparison issue. We're going to talk about, spend probably one hour about that. Uh, but I do probably will get to that tomorrow morning in the first session. So that's the uh, structure of the, this talk. So first of all, why do we lead the group analysis? The, the reason is simple. We do science. We need to say something about the population. We don't, we were quote some subjects, right? Like 20 subjects in the end, we don't say something specifically about those individual subjects. Instead, our interest, our focus is on the, some population or the difference between the populations, like patients versus uh, controls. So that's why we need to make some general statement about the whole population at the population level. Um, so that's basically the reason we, we uh, perform um, the, this group analysis step. So this simple as a case, when we do group analysis, suppose we have here we have seven subjects. So suppose we just focus on one voxel. At the group level, basically we want to say something but the, the centrality, the average of those seven subjects. I mean, when we have seven numbers, there are a couple of ways to, to say something about the, those seven subjects. First, we have the average, which is the mean. Right? So that's some statistic. It says the, the centrality of those seven numbers. That's one way to, to describe it. Another way is say how spread out those seven numbers are, which is that, that is the uh, standard error, the concept of standard deviation. So that's how concentrated that light number shows how concentrated or how spread out those seven numbers are. So those are the two quantities. The first is basically shows that's a f uh, average. The second one is shows the the, uh, the reliability of that that they are mean, not the average. So we combine those two numbers. That's the t statistic. So the, the the mean divided by the standard error of the mean. That's the t statistic. So the t is a dimensionless number, right? So the, the, the mean is, is something interpretable. We, in, in our context, it's a percentage single change. But the T does not have any unit. It's just a dimension, dimensionless number. So in the end, we have two values. One is the mean, other is the T statistic. Right. So the, those, uh, unfortunately, in, in your imaging, people pretty much focus on the T statistic. That doesn't mean the, the average is not important. Instead, it is important, but it's just uh, the current trend, I mean, uh, the, in the field is a little bit un un unhealthy. So then we, based on the T studies, we can say something about, uh, about uh, the mean, right? If the T is relatively big, 
and uh, based on the traditional statistic, so we have that law hypothesis, uh, then we see it, it's um, reasonable to reject law hypothesis. Then we can see, oh, the, uh, this voxel, we can reasonably say they are, make a statement that uh, they, it's uh, activated. That's the concept of a statistic significance. So we say the threshold, for example, 0 0.05. So that's a one group of subjects. Now, suppose we have uh, uh, two groups, right? So suppose still one voxel, seven numbers, uh, seven subjects in one group, another uh, seven subjects in other group. Same thing, but we just compare the two groups. So first of all, get the mean of the group difference, which is the, the, the two means, then uh, get the difference. So that's the mean difference. Then standard, standard deviation, same thing. We get the, the standard deviation of the, the group means, uh, group difference. So then uh, we calculate study, uh, the t statistic. Another way is uh, called the paired t test. That's we have one group of subjects, but we have two conditions, right? So like house versus face. But this situation, uh, this uh, scenario can be reduced to one sample t test because we only have seven subjects. Each subject we can get reduce the two conditions, basically get the difference between the two conditions. So it's essentially. It's just the equivalent to a one sample t test. So in the end, you get the, the mean of the, the condition difference, the, uh, then the standard deviation of the, the, uh, the group mean. So that's the cartoonish description of the, the three different types of uh, t tests. So then, from modeling perspective, we can say something. I mean, it's pretty much the same. We have seven numbers. So we have the mean, so right, divided by seven, we get the average. For example, the average is, in this case, 0.92% single change. So if we write the model that down below, the equation, it's essentially it's a regression model or it's a linear model, but it's the regression with only have any in, uh, explanatory variable. It's just like intercept. So it's a regression model, but it's a special case. So that's on the left-hand side, Notice that I put the beta values. That's because the betas are from each individual subject, right? So the, that's the estimated beta. Um, on the right-hand side, just the intercept, plus the residuals. You, also, you may also notice on the left-hand side, I put a hat above the, the beta value. What does that hat mean? In mathematical notation, the hat means it's estimated values. There are not direct observations from, so, we will call the subjects, the direct observations are the, uh, the EPI time series. Those betas are, we, went to th we usually went through many steps, pre-processing, then uh, individual subject uh, regression analysis. So the betas are not the right measurements, right? So they are basically, uh, it's our estimations. So since there are estimations, they are not, um, they have some reliability issue, that means we're not 100% sure those values are accurate or not. So each beta, in, in, in fact, each beta has some has a, a standard error associated with, with it. So, but the typical FMI group analysis, we ignore that reliability information. We ignore the, the standard error. We just focus on the beta. That's just some lazy approach. That's, that approach works reasonably well if we ignore that reliability information, but uh, we could improve that, but we'll fix, uh, come back to that issue later. So let's just uh, stick to the traditional approach. Just take the beta values from each, from the individual subjects, then do uh, the typical group analysis. So in this case, we just have one sample t-test, right? So that's the, the linear model. So in the end, the last line shows that we keep in mind we have two values in the, at each voxel. One is the group average, then we have the T statistic. Um, so to group analysis, uh, there are, uh, the traditional approach, the conventional statistic is always we have the concept of a law hypothesis, right? Pretend nothing going on in the brain. That's our starting point. Then uh, we calculate the T statistics, calculate the average, then if the T statistic is large enough, so then we can reject the law hypothesis. Then we make a decision, every voxel or every region in the brain, whether we claim that region is activated or the other regions are not 
I mean, it's not statistically significant. So that, in the end, it's um, the conclusion is a binarized uh, decision. So that's um, very unfortunate because in reality, we know the brain is not either they are activated or not activated. Probably, most likely, most of the regions are activated. That's just because uh, most regions they are, they the, the effect size is too small. I mean, for example, one region, the, the signal is 0.1% single change. It's too weak. If we really want to probably detect such a weak uh, effect, we may probably recruit, many, I mean, hundreds of subjects. So just because of the, uh, that one region fails to reach this statistical significance, does not necessarily mean that region is not activated. We cannot make such a statement. So that's we always do, need to keep in mind. We are making, whenever what conclusion you make, it's about the statistical significance. It's not about the effect size significance, right? So it could be one region fail, the failure of a region reaching this statistical significance simply means it's just that the failure to which that is that this is the threshold doesn't mean there's low activation in that region. So you always need to keep that in mind. Um, of course, there are many caveats other than they just the binarize the decision. Uh, I mean, we every subject's brain is unique in the sense the shape is different. The re, each region's location is probably slightly different. Right, so even the region size different. So we, when we do group analysis, we have to warp individual subject brains to some standard space. That warping, that alignment is not, of course, is not per perfect. Right, so that uh, may cr create some problem about. Uh, I mean, this have, have, would have some impact on the statistical significance. Right, if the alignment is not perfectly aligned. Um, so that's. Also, a, a reason to motivate us to do uh, the RI-based approach, which uh, we'll talk about tomorrow morning. So that's uh, we'll see how that uh, uh, how that they achieve maybe uh, I mean as an alternative maybe achieve better power detection power. Um, another uh, way. Uh, perspective I want to point out is that nowadays the group model is also be it's gradually becoming more and more complicated. In the early days, students' t-tests would be good enough, right? T-tests, you can do one sample, two sample, or pair the t-tests. So later on, I mean, gradually people start to use an ANOVA approach. And then ANOVA is, I mean, so you have one or more than one factor, right? As a categorical variable, like groups, multiple groups or you have task or multiple tasks, or the combination of the two, so that's ANOVA. Then you may have um, a general leader model. By general leader model, that means you may have um, some quantitative variables, right? So like age, you want to control the age variability across subjects, or IQ, or a, a reaction time. So once you throw in one or more uh, quantitative variables, then you have ANCOVA or general leader model. Then, if you have longitudinal study, then you, then you may have missing data, for example. That's a, a, another complication. Or you have some quantitative variable. That quantitative variable is uh, within subject quantitative variable. What does that mean? Like reaction time. Suppose you have two conditions, house and face. Both conditions, you have reaction time. So that's called a within subject uh, quantitative variable. Unlike age, each subject, you only have one number associated with, with that subject. But your reaction time, suppose you have two conditions, house and face, so that's a within subject uh, uh, covariant. How to deal with that? That requires a linear mixed effects model approach. So those are the possible scenarios uh, we will cover at the, at the group level. So that's why we sometimes we lead a big models. That uh, means you put all the possible variables in the, throw in the, the, the model, then uh, that's uh, the big approach. Before I talk about the specific model approaches, we need uh, uh, clarify some of the terminologies. So for example, at the group level, remember, it's regardless what models 
what model you uh, want to adapt, either t-test, ANOVA, ANCOVA, general linear model, or even linear mixed effects modeling. We have y, I mean, on the left, hand, the, the variable on the left-hand side, the y. That y is, we call it a response variable or outcome variable. In the old days, people call, may call it a dependent variable, but uh, nowadays, the trend is uh, probably way. That, that terminology is uh, fading away. So on the right-hand side, that depends on the nature of the, each variable. You may have, like, for example, factor. Factor is a categorical variable, right, to categorize the, uh, the, the so it's not a quantitative variable, so it's a quality, qualitative variable. So that, basically, there are two um, big categories. One is we categorize the, uh, the tasks, right, so that's, um, Called a within subject, I mean, in psychology, people call it a within subject factor. Uh, so, uh, sometimes uh, they may be called a repeated measures factor, right? So, like house versus face, or if it's an emotion study, you may have positive emotion, negative, or neutral emotions, right? So, you have three in that case, three levels for that factor. So, that's one um, kind of a factor. Another one is called a between subjects factor. So that you uh, classify each subject based on the something like if it's male versus female, so that's gender, or it's um, if, whether it's a patient or uh, or control, so that's another way. Uh, or you may have genotypes or handedness, right? Left-handed versus right-handed. So that's a uh, between subject factor. The lastly, um, I want to mention. It's, it's not popular, but it's, it's, uh, under some context, people describe the subject itself as a, as a factor, is called a random effects factor. So people usually don't mention it, but in, from modeling perspective, the subjects are, uh, I mean, uh, 10 subjects, you basically have a factor of with 10 levels. It, the reason we call it random effects factor, I will come back to this point later, but the reason is that we don't care about, I mean, we don't want, in the end, we don't want to say something about each individual subject uh, effect at all. But the reason we include them, we use them as a representatives for the population. So they are, in fact, under some scenarios, uh, actually most scenarios, the, the subjects are a variable in, in the model. They are just, uh, usually we don't say, I mean, explicitly say them, but they are from modeling perspective, they are. Uh, uh, some terms associated with each subject. So uh, the second half of the slide, basically we describe the, uh, the second big category is the quantitative variable. Sometimes people call it covariant, but the, the word covariant is a little bit uh, um, uh, messy in, in your image because there are, uh, there are two different ways, uh, two different usages people describe uh, when they use the word covariant. So sometimes people use the word covariant to mean a variable of low interest. So in that use, with that usage, people can mean can be can be a factor or can be a, a quantitative variable, right? So, the, but in that case, people simply say, "I don't care about. I don't. I'm not going to describe the uh, the effect of that variable." So that can be factor. For example, gender, right? So that in other software packages, people will say, I, I, "I we model a gender as a." as a covariant. When they say that, simply they mean they just throw in that variable into the model as an additive effect. Whether it's interaction or not, they don't even mention it. They don't, usually they don't do it. They just say, I, somehow there's a magic modern approach sort of to control that, the variability of that variable. So that can be a, a, a factor or can be a quantity like H, right? So, so that usage is a little bit vague and also from modern perspective, it's problematic. Uh, I will come back to that later on too. So, so to avoid that confusion, I usually simply mean uh, I don't avoid the word covariant, or when I use it, I usually say it's a quantitative covariant to clarify, to make it explicit. So I usually um, just describe the, the, uh, each variable based on the nature of the variable, whether it's a, a categorical, which is a factor, or it's a quantitative uh, variable. So for me, covariant usually I mean is a quantitative variable. So now let's switch to the uh, another uh, way uh, descriptive uh, uh, terminology for a variable, experimental variable. It's a fixed effects versus random effects. 
Fixed effects, that's pretty much usually um, like typical uh, variables like tasks, right? Like positive, negative, neutral. So that factor, emotion factor has three levels. So we care about each level of that factor. So that's why called fixed effects. So in, in a sense, that's pretty much like uh, in physics, something uh, uh, we want to measure, right? In the end, we need to discuss it. That's, uh, it, it is a constant in the model under the traditional statistical modeling approach. So we will see later on the, what, exactly what it means in, from the modeling perspective. So that, that's, that's typical like factors, even, um, or even quantitative variables, they are fixed. In a sense, they are, they are parameters. It's a, we consider them as a constant. So in contrast, oh, before we talk about let's uh, use the example I showed yesterday to, uh, for the, uh, we, we use the example to describe the modern approach, which we don't make assumption about the hemodynamic response function. Instead, we model the hemodynamic response function with tens, multiple tens, multiple basis function. So we use this experiment design, which we have four conditions, right? So two by two. So either it's a human versus a tool. That's the first column is human, the second column is a tool. So that's one factor. Another factor is the, um, the image type, whether it's a uh, well image versus a dark image. So the first row is a well image, the second row is the dark image. So it's a two by two design, two factors. First factor is a human versus tool. The second factor is a well image versus a dark image. So with those four conditions, we have two factors. So that's uh, people sometimes call it a fact, uh, factorial design. So two by two, each factor has two levels. So then, uh, and both factors are fixed effects. That's because we, in the end, we care about the specific uh, uh, effect for, for each level and each compilation of, of that uh, two by two design. So the other, in contrast, the other concept is called a random effects factor. For fMRI, the, that's the only, usually the only one is the, um, the, uh, the subject. Because that, as I mentioned a couple of times before, the, those, the subjects in the model actually are, there are parameters associated. For example, in this model, this is a, a linear mixed effects model that um, um, better to uh, describe the concept of a random effects factor. So on the left-hand side, here I use Y sub I. So that's the, uh, usually the effect estimates from each individual subject. On the right-hand side, we have the, uh, the design matrix X, that's the fixed effects design matrix, plus the beta. Here the beta is the, I mean, the, the design matrix can be, can be your, uh, uh, the, those factors, like, like task factors, positive, negative, neutral, or can be uh, gender, right, male versus females. So they are modeled through those uh, fixed effects. So in the fixed, in a sense, those, the betas are constants. We don't know them. We don't know their values, but the assumption is they are fixed, they are constants. So we need to estimate them. However, in the, this, the second part, this part, so there is a design matrix. There's also there's a parameter. But the design, this is the random effects part. So the B sub I, that corresponds to each subject. So this is the fixed effects. That means we assume it's like pretty much like the physics, the, uh, like gravitational constant, same thing. But here, we assume each individual subject is, has some unique personality, a unique response in each region. So this here, that's the deviation part of each subject from the, uh, the population effect. So that's the uh, random effects part. The last term is the, uh, the residuals. Uh, residual, I mean, it's um, just fluctuation. So this part, that's why we call it a uh, Effects. That shows the each individual's uh, uh, difference from the, from the population effect. So in the end, we don't talk about this part. And also the reason we call it one of effects is that because the, the B sub i's, they're not fixed. And we make assumption, that assumption usually it's the typical one of the Gaussian distribution. So it's a random variable, unlike the, uh, the fixed effects here, the, this is the, the constants, right? We don't know, it, but we need to estimate them. But here, that's just, a, we make assumption, just pretty much like the residuals, we assume they follow Gaussian distribution. We already talked about the difference between the fixed versus random effects. 
So the, the next thing I want to talk about is the, the concept of a main effect versus uh, interaction. Main effect, well, that's when we have two, at least two factors. Main effect, that's, uh, I mean, everybody already learned this in uh, basic statistic classes, right? So main effect, basically, suppose you have two or more levels for a factor. So like emotion, we have positive, negative, neutral, three, three levels. So the main effect, basically, is omnibus test. So three conditions, that means the law hypothesis, all the three conditions are equal. So then we need to do F test. That F test, if turns out uh, it's significant, then we can see at least one of the conditions is different from the other two. But with three conditions, we are not so sure where exactly the difference is because with three, that can be the first one is different from the other two or can be the second or third. So we don't know. There's a vagueness associated with such an F test. Um, so usually we have to go through people call it a post hoc test. So part that that uh, that omnibus test. So even with two conditions like uh, positive versus uh, new, uh, neutral, suppose just two conditions. If you do such an F test, um, that's usually it's um, uh, usually it's a T test is good enough. But if you really want to do an F test to a main effect, then you have to get, get an F. But in that case, the F is, uh, is always positive. It doesn't tell you the directionality. So that even though the F test, is, in theory, is equivalent to a, a, a paired T test. So that's a main effect. Interaction, that's when we have two factors, right? So two factors. For this, this for suppose we have gender male versus female, then we have two conditions, positive versus negative. So whenever we say there's an interaction, basically it's a, a way, I mean, ge geometrically described, those two lines are uh, not parallel with each other. So that means they have inter, uh, interaction. So the two plots basically describe exactly the same thing. They just they use two different ways to describe it. On the left-hand side, the, uh, the x-axis show, shows the, the gender, right? So they are, the uh, two conditions is, uh, is described with two colors, with two different lines. On the right-hand side, the x-axis is the two conditions, negative and the neutral. The gender, the male versus female, is uh, uh, described with the two lines. So it's just two different ways to, to visualize the, uh, the interaction effect. So on the right-hand side, the immediately we see they intersect those two lines. So that's, I mean, ju ju uh, the, the, we, the intuitively shows the, the interaction effect. On the left-hand side, we have to extend the two lines to, to, uh, to show the, uh, the interaction effect. So that's just two factors. If you have more than two factors, three-way or even four-way interaction, depends on how sophisticated your experiment design is. So then uh, that's just, we'll talk about the factors. If you have factor, one factor and one quantity variable, you may also have interaction between those two different types of uh, variables, right? Suppose you have gender, male, male versus female, you have age. We can also talk about interaction. In that case, it's just that age effect is different between the two groups. So that's, that's why when I say in the field, the other software packages usually say, I, they, they, I covariate out age. That, when they say that, usually they mean they make a strong assumption the age effect is the same across the two groups. They didn't model the interaction between, between the, the group, two groups and the age effect. So from modeling perspective, that whenever they say that, I already know that they, they have some, they already make a, a strong assumption without modeling the, the interaction effect. So that's why I usually, uh, I mean, don't focus on the, the, the word uh, the, when people say covariate, simply mean 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 that uh, there is a variable of low interest. So that usually indicates they have some problems with their modeling approach. So I, I mean, lastly, the, here I mentioned even the two quant quantity variables, two covariance, you can also talk about the interaction. I mean, for example, even just one variable like age, we can talk about interaction age. If we just put the age. As, as an additive effect in the model, you already assume it's a linear, linearity effect, 
right? So potentially you could have self-interaction. That means you could have higher order of, uh, uh, I mean, like quadratic or even cubic. We don't know unless you try it out, right? So uh, the complication of uh, interactions, different types of uh, different uh, types of different order of interactions, right? So for example, this slide basically shows you have two groups or two conditions. Uh, then uh, you will have use, if H is a covariant. So if we if we make us on the left hand side, we make an assumption uh, there's no interaction. Basically, you you just put H as an additive effect. Then uh, you just the model just if you don't tell it to have an interaction, they just uh, you get what you are looking for, right? On the right hand side, uh, then uh, uh, potentially maybe there is an interaction effect. So when when you when we analyze the data. Don't ask for it, of course, you will not get the, the effect. So that's basically, I think, it's the, um, the terminology perspective. So some background information. So now let's look at uh, a particular example. So it's reasonably simple scenario for nowadays for a neural imaging study. So suppose we have a two by three a mixed and COVA. What do I mean? So when, first of all, it's a two by three. That means we have two factors. The first factor, we have two levels. Second factor has three levels. That, that's the part two times three, right? So it's a two factors. Mixed, and that word means the two factors are different type. One is between, other one is uh, within. So on COVA, that means we have a third of variable is a some quantitative variable so that's basically those uh, three three uh, words <coughs> um, what they mean so specifically the first factor is a group the two groups we have patients versus control the second factor factor B is a condition it's an emotion experiment you have three levels positive negative and neutral so then we have if, if we consider subjects is a, 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 a factor which is a uh, one of the effects factor. So in this case, we have totally 30 subjects. 15 is a, a patient, I mean, this uh, autistic uh, uh, spectrum disorder kids. Then the other 15 are healthy controls. So then if we want to control the variability of age, so we, we want to model the age as a quantitative variable. So that's uh, basically the, the situation we have. How do we do with this? It's a two by three plus uh, throw, we throw in age as a, uh, as a uh, covariate. So even for such a simple data structure, it's for soft, uh, your image software package, this is a challenge actually. It's not a simple, uh, simple uh, data uh, structure to handle actually. So how do we do it? Well, let's ignore the um, they co covariate the age first, right? So let's just focus on the ANOVA part. If we do ANOVA um, again, this is a two by three mixed ANOVA, right? So not the ANCOVA, let's put the, the age aside. So for that, if we look at the textbook, look at the F study is a two by three ANOVA. So this is, those three are the, I mean, two main, two factors or two main effects plus the interaction. If you look at the formula, it's like this. I mean, we don't pay attention to the, 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 those wiggles underneath. But the F study is basically the ratio of two. So I highlight the denominators. Those two main effects have different denominators. So the first factor, first that's the between subject factor, that denominator is different than the other two F tests. So that it's makes the life, our life is miserable because if you do this, um, use the traditional approach, for example, using so-called univariate general leader model approach to handle this, then you have to be very careful about the, uh, the denominator. Unfortunately, in FRMI, this part is not done properly, simply because the, the denominator is different. If we use the univariate general leader model approach, people would they have to, I mean, if you're not careful, they usually use uh, the same denominator. So that caused the failed during the past 25 years. The, so many studies, they are, are done improperly. 
in the literature because the, because this approach is dominantly adopted adopted in uh, some software packages. So that's just a simple case, a two by three or even two by two. If you have a scenario with uh, two factors, one is between, the other one is within, the between subject factor F is usually is not done correctly. So if, if you use the linear mixed effect model approach. So that's, that's because they use this uh, so-called general linear model. That's in the end, they only have this uh, uh, residual part, there's just one. So that's why they use the same delaminator for, for all the th uh, uh, three uh, F tests. So that approach is, even though it's popular in neuroimaging, but, uh, but uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's not, I only made about the F statistic. If you do post hoc test for the T test, the problem continues continues to, uh, to extend to the t-test. So that there are multiple issues. So uh, I don't want to go to details, but uh, <laughs> it's described here, the problems even for, for those uh, t-tests. So that's one scenario. So here, uh, actually this slide shows the, the F statistic is, done, is not done correctly when you use the general linear model approach. I um, mean, they don't use the term general linear model, but they use something else, but, but the problem is the same. So also the t-tests, so the, those are the scenarios, so uh, uh, can, be, can be problematic. Another scenario is that um, it's not just the, the, the mixed type. Even for the situation when, when you have two factors, both factors are with subject, that problem is even worse because if you still use the general linear model approach, both main effects for those two factors would be wrong. So that, the general linear model approach. And that problem also ex, uh, would, extend to, uh, would be extended to the, the post hoc test uh, as well. So because of those problems uh, with the general linear model approach, and also you cannot handle covariant when you do ANOVA. So the, there's a better way to do it. This is not something uh, in theory is complicated. I mean, People have adopted a better approach for many years, like in SAS, in SPSS, I mean, nowadays in R. I mean, people have been doing this correctly for many years already. So it's not so complicated, simply because the neural imaging field is not uh, switched, I mean, it's not realized, uh, or they are not willing to correct the problem. So this approach is, I mean, it's widely available in, outside of uh, neural imaging. It's, Instead of using univariate general linear model, we use multivariate uh, general linear model. So that simply solved the problem. So the, I don't want to go to the technical details. Basically, on the left-hand side, instead of one column, based on the, uh, the within subject factor, we can use the matrix instead of a, a vector. So that solved all the problems. First, the F statistic would be uh, properly formulated. In addition to that, we can put the quantitative variables into the model easily, as long as it's between subject uh, quantitative variable, like age, like IQ, like uh, uh, whatever other brain volume, for example. So uh, of course, this will not be able to handle within subject covariance, like a reaction time, you have multiple conditions, then this would not, not be good enough. So except for that, and also except for missing data scenario, this multivariate general linear model would be very adaptive. So that's um, that's uh, uh, extension. Yafni, which the program 3D MVM, basically is uh, the underlying mechanism is about uh, is uh, this uh, multi-universe general linear model approach. Another point. Uh, about, uh, I'm switching to a topic, is that, um, as I m briefly mentioned before, when we go to group level, usually we only take the betas from the individual subject analysis for group analysis, right? So whenever we do that, we make an assumption, we assume those betas are <coughs> equally variable. What do I mean when I say that, equally variable? That means that we ignore the standard errors of those betas. Ignoring, that means they are, 
suppose you have 10 subjects, the betas are equally variable. Basically, the standard errors are the same across those subjects. So that's usually not the case. Then you may ask, can we do it better? Or what's the consequence if we ignore it? So the alternative is we don't ignore the standard error. Instead, we take, we consider the standard error, put in the model. So that's the alternative approach. That approach, it's, um, I mean, other fields like the meta-analysis, not in FRMI. The meta-analysis in FRMI is it's messy. I, I don't want to touch it. But the, the other field, when people do meta-analysis, basically, you have multiple studies, right? You, you need a, a synthesize or summarize the cross studies. You really need to take both betas and the standard errors into consideration. So how do we do it? That's the question. Well, one way to look at this is the, the old approach. You only take the betas. Basically, you treat those betas equally variable. That means their weights. The weights is the same. But here, we don't treat them equally. Suppose we have 10 subjects. We're going to de de discriminate those 10 subjects based on how reliable each subject is. So one subject, if the beta, and also there's a standard error, if that standard error is small, that means it's more reliable, I'm going to trust this subject more versus another subject with a less reliable. So that's what I call discrimination. So I'm going to do weighting based on the each subject's uh, uh, the, uh, the reliability of the effect estimate. So then you may ask, where do we get that reliability information? That information is available. It's just, in, we don't realize it. It's embedded in the T statistic. Why? Remember, what is T? T is beta divided by standard error. So we know the T, we know the beta, then now it's just beta divided by T then you get the denominator of the T, that, which is the standard error. When we do individual subject analysis, we have beta and the T. We just take both pieces of, uh, of the information to group analysis. The program will automatically calculate the standard error, I mean, just beta divided by T. So then we just do weighting. We just uh, differentiate the, 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 those subjects. So that's, the approach is actually is pretty intuitive. It just, uh, that is, uh, Done in in FNA, the program is called the 3D MIMA, mixed effects multi-level uh, analysis. So that basically, as a user, you just take both beta and the t as input, feed into this program. Well, sounds nice, right? But there are a couple of downsides as well, of course. First of all, the computation cost is much higher because there's more input. Also, because this, I mean, uh, the algorithm is more complicated as well, not just uh, the, the input uh, amount of data. So that takes much longer. That's one thing. Another thing is, it's uh, from modeling perspe perspective, I can only do simple scenarios, like you, do, you have two groups or you have two conditions, simply. Basically, it's like the typical t-test. Either sample t-test, paired t-test, or um, to sample two groups or multiple groups, that's fine. But if you have compilations or you have multiple conditions, then uh, it's getting uh, complicated. You really, we have to reduce a uh, sophisticated scenario into a, I call it a piecemeal approach to break into pieces. Then we can use the, this, uh, uh, <clears throat> this I call the mixed effects pattern approach to, to handle it. 